talk more about Trump's pick to run the EPA. Syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer joins us now. I think it's fair to say that Democrats' hair is on fire about the pick of Scott Pruitt. How worried should they be? They should be worried because they have overreached now for eight years, and that's about to be stopped in its tracks. All the coverage has been on the fact that he believes X, Y, or Z about climate change, as if we have a religious test for office in the country, because uh, this, as we just heard, climate change is a kind of a religion. But the fact is, we don't care if the guy believes that the moon is made of green cheese. His job is to administer. That means to carry out the law as passed by Congress. The complaint of the, of the right of conservatives about this administration, it is absolutely trampling the idea of administrators as interpreting the law. They make it up, and that's why the EPA has been stymied time and again in the courts, led by Pruitt and other attorney generals, uh, when they try to overstep. They interpret the law in a way that gives them absolute dominion over almost everything. If it rains on your farm and creates a pond, the, the feds, the EPA, claims the right to regulate you. And that's going to stop. For folks like you, who I think it's fair to say doubted whether or not Donald Trump was a true conservative, when you look at people like Scott Pruitt at EPA and Andy Puzder today at Labor and Tom Price running Health and Human Services, this is shaping up on the domestic side as a very conservative cabinet. Without question. And each of these appointments appears targeted at a specific thing like school choice for education. The EPA is going to be on the essentially Obama taking over the energy industry. He tried by legislation in 2009 and 10 when he had control of the Congress with cap and trade and even the Democrats rejected that and he did as he's done in a dozen other areas try to legislate the regulation. And that's why I think conservatives are very encouraged by these appointments. We share several passions, baseball, politics, and space exploration. We've, you and I have talked about that a lot. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the passing of John Glenn. Well, John Glenn was the most celebrated American adventurer of the century, second only to Charles Lindbergh, and he deserves it. He was, un he was insanely courageous, not just a fighter a pilot in the Second World War and the Korean War, a test pilot in the 50s, in the supersonic and space age, where life expectancy was quite short for those pilots. But here he's the first man to go into orbit. He gets, imagine this, when you're, you're ready to go, and it was postponed, I think, 11 times, your colleagues, your co-workers, they strap you in, they shut the door, they go down the gantry, and they drive three miles. Not one mile, not two, not three because of the fireball that's about and, to And you're at the top of that firecracker and all by yourself. All by yourself. And your best pals, your colleagues, are in a bunker three miles away. <laughs> well, that tells you how insanely courageous they were. And remember, as you do remember, in the early 60s, we were having launch explosions with non-unmanned flights every day. And that's why it was such a chance. It seems all safe now. It wasn't. No, and I have to say, I do remember it got scrubbed. That was the word they used, scrubbed yeah. over and over again because of bad weather on the Cape. Finally, it took off. John Glenn, Godspeed. Thank you, Charles.